Uh, we're going to study Elijah. Is that okay? You heard of Elijah? Have you heard of Elijah? Have you heard of Elijah? Yeah. Oh, okay. Just want to make sure. And uh, uh, there, there's a lot of encouragement in Elijah. You know, he just, you know, somehow or another, we, we kind of think that, the, you know, these people in the Bible, they're, they're, they're the Captain America and the Thor and the Aquaman and the whatever else superhero uh, of their day. That's not true. There are people just like me and you, just everyday people who dared to trust God, who dared to believe the Lord and to claim his promises and, and, and obey. When he spoke, obey. Don't delay. You know, my daddy told me a long time ago, son, delayed obedience is disobedience. As he was thumping on me when he said, those dogs will be fed by 530. <laughs> well, dad, I was getting around to it. Well, it ain't 530. It's, past, it's, six, it's 545. I mean, you understand? Delayed obedience is disobedience. And so, and so uh, uh, let's, let's just look at uh, Elijah, the, uh, the man and his ministry the, this evening. And I, like I said, I don't know how many of these Elijah messages we're going to have. I'll just I'll keep mining and, and refining, and, and you'll keep dining until we're done, okay? You know, Elijah was a mighty man of God. He, he most certainly was. In some respects, he was the greatest of all the prophets since Moses until uh, the advent of John the Baptist. And yes, John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet. He was the last one. He said, well, he's in the New Testament. I know he's in the New Testament. But he's the last one. He's the last Old Testament prophet before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so Elijah, man, I mean, he, he is something. He, 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 you know, and you know what Jesus said about John the Baptist? I think it's Matthew 11, 11. I don't think I gave you that scripture, but I, I know it. That's the, I'm pretty sure that's the, the reference that... Uh, Jesus said about John the Baptist, there was never a greater man born of a woman than John the Baptist. Boy, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? And so, uh, um, uh, he, although, you know, Elijah lived 3,000 years ago, and his period of ministry was comparatively short. He wasn't uh, a, a, a wide, stretched-out thing. He is by no means a forgotten character. By no means. Elijah, uh, uh, as we study his life and ministry, the Holy Spirit will teach us valuable lessons. And I'm telling you, there's lessons here we need to learn, no matter who you are and where you are in life and what's going on in your life. And it will enable us to live for the Lord and serve the Lord more effectively. Elijah's sudden appearance upon the stage of Holy Scripture centers upon the tremendous announcement that he made to Ahab. Oh, Ahab, he was the king of Israel. He squatted on the throne. The toad he was. He was. And, uh, and, uh, and he had to confront this man. Uh, I want to read to you 1 Kings 16, verses 28 and following. If we have that. The scripture says that, uh, uh, says, Omri, Omri or Omri, I don't care how you say it, rested with his fathers. He was buried in Samaria. You know, uh, Israel had, uh, every one of their kings was bad. Did you know that? But they were the rebel bunch. They split off the southern kingdom when Solomon's son, Rehoboam, took over and and Rehoboam instead of listening to uh, godly counsel he said I'm going to turn up the heat they think dad was hard I'm going to I'm really going to turn it up and the and the and the northern tribes revolted and rebelled and broke away and formed uh, the northern kingdom which later became known as Israel and the southern kingdom became known as Judah every one of those kings of Israel in the Old Testament were rotten. They were bad. You see, when you start off bad, 
you know, the Lord's blessing's not there. You, you just listen, you got to go where the Lord's blessing is. Amen. And he says, so then Ahab, his son reigned in his place. Verse 29. He says in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. So 22 years, he was the potentate. Now, Ahab, um, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did every one of those northern kings, more than all the who were before him. Hmm. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, that he took a wife, Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal. Now, C-B-A-A-L, that's going to become the chief god, Baal, in Israel, the northern kingdom. You see, you know how you worship these gods? By sacrificing your children to them. That's how you worship these gods. You sacrifice your living child, your, your toddler, and you put them in the fire. No wonder God was a, a bit miffed <laughs> at these people. So he took his, his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, Son of the king of the Sidonians. Sidon is that city state north of Israel on the Mediterranean. And he went and he served Baal and worshiped him. Then the Lord, then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hael of Bethel built Jericho and laid its foundation with uh, Abram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son. Boy, how would you like to be called Segub? <laughs> set up his gates according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. And then verse 1, here we go. And, I'm, and I want you to leave that verse up there. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Whew. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Elijah's sudden appearance, just wow, he had, at this tremendous announcement. Here he goes. Who's this Elijah fella? He, he, he's a Tishbite. He's, he, he's from Gilead. What, what is all that about? Let's read, uh, let's read James 5 real quick if I gave it to you. 517 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like whose? Ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, go back to, oh, never mind. We'll be all right. So, let's, I want to, Let's look more closely at this remarkable man. Let's, and let's, uh, let us suggest several types of people to whom this series, I think, will speak to. I got five written down here, and they could be more, but there's five. First, those who feel their place of service is hard. Is that you? My place of service is hard. I was talking to somebody today, and... And they were telling me some things about their life, and man, they just, it got hard for them. Didn't know where to look, what to do. And you know, if you, if you don't know what to do, usually you get mad or angry or frustrated or all the above, don't you? You know, and, and, and from that, a root of bitterness can spring up if you're not careful. 
Those who feel their sphere, sphere of their place of service is hard. And if that's you, the story of Elijah should bring you great encouragement as we get into this. Secondly, those who feel they're alone. You're working and you're all alone. Nobody noticed. Nobody notices. Nobody cares. Nobody acknowledges it. You just work alone. How easily such are tempted to say as Elijah did, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the last one left. Well, there's encouragement for you too as we look into this study. And the third kind of person is those whose patience is sorely tried <laughs> mm -hmm. and who see few results. If you know what I mean. Elijah knew all about this. The story the story of his patience, his endurance, and ultimate achievement will encourage us all to press on. There's no place to quit. There's no place to stop. And the fourth, the fourth type of person, those who feel there, there is little they can do to influence an apostate age. I meet people like this all the time. You know, he said, Pastor, look at, look at how, how wretched things are getting. I mean, all these sexual deviates and perverts. And, and we've got people, we've got politicians, we've got preachers and churches that are, that are heralding. They're, they're bragging. They're, 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 they're holding up this kind of deviant behavior. And you think, what can I do? Well, there was little that Elijah could do, but how much it was. And, and, uh, Go, go back to that James reference, James 5, 17. The scripture says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Just like ours. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't Captain America or Superman or Iron Man or whatever other kind of man there is out there. If Luke was in here, he'd tell me all of them. You know, he was a man just like me and you. But he prayed, he believed God, he trusted God, and he stood upon that. We likewise have been given this weapon, every one of us, this, this wonderful gift, and it's a weapon called prayer. And then the last person that we can, that, that need, will be encouraged by this, I believe, the fifth one is those who have failed and who hasn't. Who hasn't failed? Who hasn't fallen short who hasn't you know you think you're thinking good things and then it just breaks all apart the story of elijah contains one sad incident and in first kings 19 you can read that later when god showed up and great things happened up on mount carmel and, and they and they slaughtered all those uh, false prophets and jezebel said you're going to be just like they are this time tomorrow and boy he took off running I mean, great victory, great, great, great. And then he led a, a demonized Jezebel spook him. And he took off running and hiding instead of standing and trusting God. Well, Elijah was a man just like ourselves. We tend to regard Elijah and Moses and Daniel and all those uh, prophets of the Old Testament uh, as men who walk on heights that are inaccessible to you and me. We think they're supermen. We think there's something beyond anything that anybody could be today. But who was Elijah? He was just a man just like us, a nature just like ours. He was a man just like us. No different. He had the same God we have. And he's there, and, and, and what a wonderful encouragement he is, ought to be to every follower of Jesus Christ. That, that the same God that Elijah serves is the same God we serve. A man with a nature just like yours and mine, a man. He wasn't an angel. He wasn't perfect. He was a man who at one point he failed. He failed badly. Man, I mean, you're talking about a, but he was a great man. You know, 
Failure doesn't have to be defeat if you learn from your failure. Do you hear me? <laughs> failure doesn't have to be defeat. <laughs> you stay right in my preaching there, boy. <laughs> We're told nothing about Elijah's early life or his upbringing. He's described as Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead. And as his name means, Elijah means, means God is Yahweh. Or, or God uh, and Yahweh has the idea of the self-existent one, the strong one. I mean, second to none. That's who his God is. That, that tells something about him. That, that probably indicates that he had godly parents. To name their son Elijah. Now, I know today people name their kids' names because it sounds good. Or I've got a singer or a movie star. Or, you know, uh, only in our lifetime has that been the case. Before then, they, people would name their, their loved ones' names because it meant what it meant. And, and so here, here he is. He's a, he's, a, he's a Tishbite. He's from Gilead. But his name means God. God is my, my stronghold. God is Yahweh. God is, 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 that's my God. And this, we can, we can be sure, however, that God had been preparing him all through his life. You know, you might not see it, but God's preparing you for something. And it doesn't matter how, how good or how hard, how much it wants you to, to shout for joy or weep in brokenness. God's got it. And he's there. And he's working. And he's preparing you. And he's setting you up to bring him glory and for you to be a great blessing to others. And listen, you'll be blessed in the doing. Here he is. He's set up. God's training him. You and I are being trained. I remember my dad told me a long time ago, he says, son, you, you know, you, th you, you finish school and you get your degree, you know, and all that. He says, school never ends. It never ends. It never ends. We're always in school, the school of life. God is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And here, Elijah, that this encourages me that, that every experience through which God leads us is a preparation for the further work that he has in store for us. As long as you're breathing, God has something for you to do. It, it doesn't make a difference whether you're, you're, you're a man or a woman, or your age, or what formal education, uh, level of formal education you might have. Listen, if you know Jesus, you're in his service, and he'll use you. You say, well, what I do is not really that, you know, really about anybody can do what I can do or, or it doesn't take a lot of, you know, listen, whatever it is you do, be the best at it. You can be doesn't mean you're going to be the very best there ever was, but be the best at what you can be because God's in it and he's preparing you and he's training you. And you look for God in, in, in the thing. That's exactly what I see here in Elijah's life. Uh, I heard people say, I just hate waiting. Can I tell you, waiting time is not wasting time. I mean, when, uh, when Jesus went up to the temple, he was 12, 13 years old. And, and uh, you know, they were in a big group. And they went up to, to, to worship, went up to, to the uh, festival. 
and it was time to go, and, and here they all are gone. And, you know, there's hundreds in the caravan, undoubtedly, going back north to, to Nazareth and, and along the way, Cana and Tiberias and Capernaum and wherever, all those towns, there, they're all together, close together, around near the Sea of Galilee. And they, they get out a, a day, and I guess it's supper time probably. This is the King Bobby translation. And I can just see him, you know, Mary's fixing some supper, and Joseph comes up and says, well, see, there's, there's Mo and Larry and Curly and Eleanor and Sally, and where's Jesus? And I can just see Mary saying, Oh, I thought he was with you. And Joseph, well, I thought he was with you. And Mary said, but I thought he was with you. And Joseph said, we need to turn around and go back. So there was a day out, a day back, and then they spent a whole nother day. And they finally found him. And they found him, where did they find him? In the temple, confounding the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees with his penetrating questions, his insight. He wasn't wasting time, that waiting time. Listen, when, when, when things aren't moving as quickly as you think they ought to move, God's got it. Now, you need to do all you're supposed to do. You do. We need to do what we're supposed to do. But God's got this thing, just like he did with Jesus, just like he did with Elijah. Elijah lived in a day of spiritual decline and apostasy. A succession of seven wicked kings had reigned over Israel. The way, the way I, I, I was taught to remember it you know uh, you know david it was saul and De and david and solomon and rehoboam they're the only four kings that ruled over united israel the whole the whole shooting match and then when rehoboam decided that he was going to raise everybody's taxes Wow, I never thought of it. Rehoboam must have been a little... Never mind. Uh, and people started chafing under the burden, and the ten tribes to the north rebelled and broke away and formed their own kingdom. The king that took his place was Jeroboam. And so the way dad taught me how to remember it was Rehoboam was the real king and Jeroboam was the jerk. <laughs> he was the fraud. It, you understand? And so, and so here he is, Jeroboam, uh, that's, that's, that's 1 Kings 12. And, and then, aren't you glad your dad didn't call you Nadab? And then Baasha, how would you like to be called Baasha? B double A S H A, Baasha. And then there was Elah. What'd you say? <laughs> Your name Elah too? And you know what he was noted for? Being a wine bibber and a murderer. He was a drunkard and a, and a murderer. And then Zimri, you know what he was known for? Being a traitor, being a backstabbing traitor. Guilty of treason. And then there was Omri. 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 He was Omri. Omri was. And then Ahab. With whom must be linked his notorious wicked wife Jezebel. Worship of the true God had all but ceased. Baal worship was instituted as the national religion in the northern kingdom. I don't know about you. I don't, you know, it don't matter if you're a Democrat or independent or Republican. If you watched the State of the Union address last night, you ought to be a happy American. 
You ought to be a happy American. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And, and we've got a reprieve because until President Trump took the office, do you know what the national religion was in America? Secular humanism. Secular humanism. Secular humanism says that man is his own God. He, whatever you think, if it feels good, do it. You can do anything you want. And as long as you don't hurt anybody, you're free to do whatever you want. And, and that, that's been the religion that's been gaining ground, my goodness, since World War II. Since World War II. Really took hold hard in the 70s and 80s. And it's been full throttle, full throttle. Ever since, until we have someone who's not, will, not, not intimidated and not politically correct and will say, America's national motto is, in God we trust. Whew. We got a reprieve. We got a reprieve. Now, just because we got a reprieve doesn't mean it's always going to stay that way. You know? We need to pray, pray for our president, our vice president, our Congress, that our senators and our House of Representatives will stop doing, just put America first and realize that what they do needs to honor God. Well, here they've got seven kings in the northern kingdom, and every one of them was a sorry reprobate. Every one of them was a self-centered, narcissistic, self-serving, I won't say politician, but they would fit in real good today. Do you understand? Listen, we need good politicians. We need, God we need godly people to run for office. You know, instead of believing this, oh, well, once they get in, they'll go bad. Well, you know what? I know plenty of them have not gone bad. And if you go bad, you were bad to begin with. Just saying. And so, Elijah lived in a day of spiritual decline and spiritual apostasy. Baal worship was a national religion. The Bible tells that there was only 7,000 Israelites that remained true in their heart toward the Lord God Almighty. And these were fearful and had hidden their testimony according to 1 Kings 19. A flood tide of idolatry and superstition and evil had overwhelmed the nation. Never had, God favored, uh, had God's favored nation sunk so low spiritually and morally. And that's exactly where America has gone. We've never sunk so, so low the ever than, than what had happened uh, before this new president took over. And I'm telling you, you need to pray and you need to pray every day. You need to be an Elijah. And you need to pray for America and, we, and to pray for Christians. Pray for born-again people that, that we will... Stay true to the Lord and His Word. We'll serve Him and come under His authority. And when all hell comes against us, know that God's got His people and God's right there with them, just like He was with these people. Elijah was commissioned by God to perform some very difficult task. Now you think about this. He announced the drought to Ahab in, in 1 Kings 17.1. Now, how would you like to be a nobody from nowhere, you know? And God calls you and prepares you and says, I want you to go up to the most powerful man in your country and confront him about his sin. I bet the line wasn't very long. What do you think? I don't think the line was very long at all. But he had, to, uh, he, he had to go up and announce the drought to Ahab. He challenged Ahab and the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel in, in uh, 1 Kings 18. 
You need to read those, those chapters in 1 King, Kings. And, then, and, and, you know, I've been up on Mount Carmel. Let me tell you, Mount Carmel is a windy place. I mean, boy, what a, what a sight. You can look down into the Valley of Jezreel and you can see forever. I mean, it's a perfect, beautiful valley. And there it is, and it looks, just goes all the way out. And, and uh, uh, the Israelis have an Air Force base down there. It's something. The plane will land, and then it disappears out of sight because there's an elevator. Everything's underground. Man, it's something. It's something. Napoleon, when he first saw the valley of Megiddo, uh, or Jezreel, or some people call it Armageddon. He said, this is the most perfect place on earth to have a battle. Well, you know, he's right. Because God says there's going to be a battle there. Unlike any battle it's ever been. And so, here he is. Up on Mount Carmel. Hadn't rained for three and a half years. He said, okay, let's... Let's, let's, uh, let's have a contest, Baal. Worshippers. All right, let's bring the wood. Let's dig, a, let's dig a trench all the way around. And let's pour all the water we got on, on top of the offering. Soak the wood real good. Now, people would say, wait a minute. It hadn't rained for three and a half years. We need water. No. That's, that's really not what they needed. They thought they needed water because it hadn't rained for three and a half years. You know what they needed? They needed the fire of God. And so Elijah said, okay, you guys go first. And they danced around and just in frenzy. I mean, they were cutting themselves. It's shedding blood and all bail, all bail, you know, come down and consume and prove that you're the true God and just carried on for hours. And Elijah would ag him on like, um, <clears throat> maybe he's gone to the bathroom. Maybe he's on a trip. He's on vacation. Maybe he's tired and he had to take a nap. Now, man, he was agging him on. Finally, they got done. All wore out, drug out there. And Elijah prayed. Oh, Lord, and just, phew, and I'm telling you, the fire of God came down and consumed the offering, burnt all the wood, and lapped up every drop of water. And the people who are witnessing it all said, The Lord, He is God, not Baal. And Elijah said, get every one of them, 450 of them, because we're going to slit their throats. And he, he, he executed every one of them. Every one of them. Boy, you're talking about the judgment of God coming down on sin. And then Elijah prayed. He said, go look. Well, nothing. He prayed some more. He said, go look. He says, I see a small cloud that looks like a hand. He said, we need to hightail it out of here. A gully washer is coming. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. Now, who was Elijah? He was a man who had nature just like ours. He was a man just like us. No different. He was a man that was available to God and was used of the Lord Elijah declared God's righteous judgment upon Ahab and Jezebel because they had murdered Naboth and stole his vineyard. Naboth saw that vineyard and liked it and went up to Naboth and says, I want to buy it from you. And he said, no, sir, it's not for sale. He went boo-hoo-hoo, crying, pout, whine, and Jezebel came in and said, Oh, honey, what's wrong? But your little heart. And she concocted this scheme. Naboth was murdered, killed unjustly. 
and Ahab got his vineyard. And then I'm telling you, and that's in First Kings 21. We need people with courage. Now, can Elijah's courage? Now, what is courage? Courage is not the absence of fear. Huh? Courage is doing the right thing in spite of fear. That's real courage. When you just, but you're going to do the right thing. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. Elijah's life was marked by complete separation from evil around him. A good motto over his life would be uh, um, Ephesians 5, 11. Do you have that one? Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Boy, that, that fit his life, wouldn't it? Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, the Bible says, Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them, and I'll be their God, and they'll, sh and they'll be my people. Mercy. How could Elijah have any fellowship with apostate leaders of, of Israel? His separation from evil around him was uncompromising. In Hebrews 13, 13, the Bible says, Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Yes. You know, walking with Jesus will cost you some friendships. If you've got to, if you've got to, uh, listen, stay true to Jesus. Just stay true to Jesus. It'll cost you some friendships. It'll, it'll cost you some intimate relationships. It will. And then Elijah's ministry was characterized by the supernatural. Ooh. Consider God's mighty acts in and through Elijah, fed by the ravens at the brook. Huh. Can you imagine that? An old dirty bird bringing you your biscuit. Uh, listen, ravens are pretty greedy. You know? But God commanded the ravens to bring him his food, and they did. That's amazing. Remember the widow's meal and oil replenished? Oh, what are you doing there, ma'am? Well, there's a famine. You know, it hadn't rained in three and a half years. <laughs> there's a famine. We can't get any crop, no wheat, no barley. We just can't grow nothing. We can't make flour. We just got a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. I'm going to make this cake for me and the boy, and then we're going to die. He says, make that and feed it to me. And she did. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It's the easiest thing in the world to do to give out of your abundance. But God takes notice when you give out of sacrifice. I mean, cha-ching, cha-ching in heaven's bank. To give out a sacrifice. To give out a sacrifice. Her son was raised from the dead. He called down fire from heaven. He was fed by an angel. More fire from heaven. And dividing the waters of Jordan. Those are seven miracles. That was performed by Elijah. Say, that's not many. Oh, yeah? How many have you performed? I think seven's a big number. A big number. And then, really, if you, you could probably call this a miracle. He had his own private rapture in a whirlwind <laughs> as he went up. Now, you think about that. A supernatural ministry. What kind of man was he? Was he Captain America or Iron Man or, or Thor? no. He was a man just like you and me, just like us. 
And God will use us. He'll use us in our brokenness. He'll use us, he'll use us in our in our He'll use us whether we fully understand or not. Look to Him and trust Him and be obedient to Him, and He'll use you. Don't don't associate with wickedness. Separate yourself from ungodliness and walk with the Lord. And I'm telling you, the power of God will rest upon you. And you'll see people healed. You'll see lost people saved. You'll see God move mightily in your midst. Just like Elijah, he was a man of like passion. Made out of the same stuff as you and I are. Or am. Or is. Or whatever. And then, lastly... Lastly, Elijah lived consciously in God's presence and relied upon his strength. If you can put 1 Kings 17, 1 up there again, real quick. I probably gave you another scripture. No, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Let's go, let's go to the... Uh, um, his God was the living God. His God was the covenant God. His God was... The one before whom he stood as a servant. And, 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 and then in Isaiah 40, did I give you that one? Okay, put it up there. Isaiah 40, verse 28 to 31. The scripture says, have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. In other words, there's more of him to learn than you can even learn. I've had people say, well, is this all there is to know about God? No, this is just all God wants us to know about him. There ain't enough books in the world that contain all there is to know about God. But he, he's given us enough that we in our little pea brain can be introduced to him and realize who he is and, and, and realize how much he loves us and, and, and our need of salvation and, and the joy of serving him. Yeah, I can grab a hold of that. He put it down on the bottom rung where I could get it. Listen here. He gives power to the weak. Hmm. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. You say, I'm just so tired. I'm just so weary. I'm just so broken. I've got more questions than I have answers. What am I to do? Run to him. Run to him. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Say, oh, I'm weary. Oh, he increases strength. Verse 30 says, even, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who what? Wait. Wait isn't wasted if you're waiting on the Lord. If you're walking, if you're serving, if you're doing what you know to do, and you're doing it the best you can do it, I tell you, there's no waste there, even if you have to wait. He says, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Mm. Boy, I claim missing a lot. You, you understand? They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. And then 2 Timothy 4, 17, the scripture says this. But the Lord stood with me, Paul says. Boy, I tell you, it's a comfort to know the Lord stands with you. All the demons of hell just have to shudder. Not because you're so big and brave, but your God is. And you're standing with him. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me. Listen, there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. You hear? You got to be saved. You got to be saved. And saved people ought to be baptized by immersion in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and every believer needs to, to be discipled in the Word. You need to, the Holy Spirit is your teacher. 
And you need to get in the Word, and you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you need to have, allow the gifts to be developed in you. And I have people say, well, what's the order of the gifts? Whatever order He gives them to you. They're His. Do you understand? They're, they're His. And, 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 and walk in and, and use the gifts to bring glory to the Lord and to win lost people. The gifts are just billboards for Jesus. That's what they are. And, the, and as you walk and develop in that, I'm telling you, you will have fruit of the Spirit. Love. Now that love's agape love. It's not, it's not, file, it's not friendship love. It's not eros love. That's between a husband and wife, love, intimate love. It, it's not that. It's it's not storge love. That that that's the kind of love uh, that uh, will come alongside to help you even when you're injured. Storge. That's where we. That's where they got the word stork for the the big birds. You know. When storks fly, and, and they fly great distances, sometimes uh, they'll injure a wing in doing that. And, and they can't keep up, and they, they'll lose altitude. And what a stork will do is, stand up here with me, little storky. <laughs> and I hold out your little, you hold out your arms. You're flying now. You're a stork, okay? Okay? And, 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 she, and, she, and, and, and the wing is hurt. Another stork will come along and put its wing right here, and he'll flap this one. And she's flapping that one, helping them to get to their place where they can land and where they can rest and gain strength and recuperate and recover. Storge love. That's wonderful love. Phileo love is wonderful love. Eros love, let me tell you. <laughs> it's wonderful in the bonds of matrimony. It's not sin then. But that's not the kind of love that's a fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is agape love. And that's loving like God. That's loving you that's loving others, even when they're not very lovable. That's loving others, even though they don't love you back like they should. That's loving others, even when they might even hurt you. Or harm you. Or attack you. You see, because the Lord knows if, if, you can't, you can't carry the grudge. The grudge is a shackle that enslaves you. That unforgiveness shackles you. And Elijah had plenty of reason to carry a lot of grudges. But not one time do we see it. Not one time. And he realized, and the Apostle Paul undoubtedly drew from things that he'd been taught about Elijah. And he said, the Lord stood with me. He stood with Elijah. He strengthened me just like he did Elijah. And so that the message might be preached fully through me just like Elijah. And that the Gentiles might hear. Did you know Elijah went to the Gentiles as well as to the Jew? Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Well, he was delivered out of the mouth of a raven. <laughs> he was delivered out of the mouth of Jezebel. Do you understand? And then, and then, just let me close with this. Daniel eleven thirty two, 32, the scripture says this. He says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. If you're looking for the praise of man, man becomes your God. But when you look at the praise, when you're looking for the praise of God, that's all it takes. Amen. Elijah. Man, he was special. Yes, God made him special because he was available. And he was willing 
to follow the Lord, even when he was fearful. And you know what? I know Elijah was a, was a man just like you and me because it tells where he failed when he ran from Jezebel. Do you understand? The Bible tells the, all, the whole truth. Shows the good and shows the not so good. But you see, God loves people like you and me. He loved Elijah. And Elijah was just like us. Elijah, he was something. He was just a man. But he had a ministry. It was a powerful ministry. It was a great ministry. And he was just a man. And I want you to know, whoever you are, you say, I don't know a whole lot. Well, I know a great teacher. He's the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm, I'm in such pain. Yes. He'll heal your heart. He'll encourage you. He's there for you. He'll always be there for you. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus... Or if you're here tonight and you're a, you're a believer, you're a follower of Jesus, and we all, we all get there, you know, we fail or we, we hurt or we've been betrayed or we've been used, give it to him. Don't, don't bear it. Don't carry it around. If you're here and you have physical need, if you need healing, you need a touch in your body, listen, my God is able. I'm telling you. Oz Ekoff has the broken arm. This one. It's raised right hand. Listen, it's going to heal. It's going to come together. It's already healed. It's just in the process of obeying what I'd already done, what Jesus done for it. Do you hear me? You pray for, pray for Oz. You pray for him. Pray for Earl Parker. He's on a diet. Oh, I'm sure he's just loving it. Pray for Charlene. She's got to listen to him. <laughs> Do you understand? Boy, Elijah, he was a super, super, super follower of God. No, he was a follower of God, just like you and me. God used him in super ways, but I want you to know he'll use you too. Let's stand to our feet. Father, in Jesus' name, have your will and way in our hearts and our lives. This altar is open to whoever needs prayer. Who help, help everyone to respond to the Holy Spirit. And Father, use us. Use us. Lord, let us cross the path of someone that we can invite to the house of God this Sunday. Or better yet, even make the door so, so open that we can tell them how to come to Jesus. And we pray in your name. Amen.